I'm going to take a second to talk about Apple's M1 chip, because even though I am a Linux user, what Apple does in the market kind of paves the way. As much as I don't like them as a company, they make really good hardware. And that hardware often is a door opener for other hardware. The thin and light design, there was a combination of the work between Intel and Apple for the original Air, is why we finally moved away from the big 10-pound brick laptops. It was going to happen eventually anyways, but Apple proved that it could be economically viable for the hardware manufacturers to do that. And now we have Ultrabooks, which are great. So I think a similar trend is going to happen with the Apple ARM chips moving to the desktop. I'm going to start by talking about my Raspberry Pi. This is a Raspberry Pi. Well, actually, this is a uh, Raspberry Pi in a case. This is the brand new Raspberry Pi 4 with the 8 gigs of RAM. This is in no way a powerhouse machine. However, with this machine being a, I think a, I think total it was $70 for the chip, for the 8 gig model. And it does a very good job of running a desktop. Does it compare to an i7 desktop? No, not even remotely close. But it does excel in a lot of ways. For the amount of uh, power input, um, power pull this has from the mains, um, to the amount of work it can do, it stomps any of the lightest weight chip Intel chipsets. Now let's pretend that um, if I, I could get one of these that was six times faster than this, and instead of $80, it cost me $600. Like a cost to power uh, ratio. This thing would be very powerful. It would actually probably rival the Intel chipset. And really, if you think about it, that's kind of the idea behind Apple's M1 with a giant asterisk, of course, because Apple was smart enough to start building hardware specific to tasks that they wanted to uh, conquer into their silicon chipset. So, for example, when Apple decodes a video um, for their video editor or composites that video for the video editor or renders out the video, there is specially tuned hardware outside of the CPU designed to do those tasks. And if you think about it, at the end of the day, you don't need a lot of horsepower if those tasks are doing their job. It doesn't hurt because of the relatively brilliant layout of an ARM chip that you could do those things. Um, you, you could get that horsepower you need, but on top of it, have those dedicated chips. That's the secret sauce. And that's what I think is exciting about the Apple M1 chip is it delegates those specific tasks that it needs to do to specialized hardware and then they, on top of it, have a pretty powerful ARM chipset. So it's impressive hardware. It's not something that only Apple could do, but it's something that only Apple could do as efficiently as Apple did because of the total control of the hardware and the total control of the software. Will this be something that is always only Apple-centric? The ability to assign hardware to tasks? Definitely not. And if you look at the future of RISC-V, you're going to see that Apple may be the first one to market, but they're not the only ones doing computers this way, at least not in the near future. And I, I know a lot of people like to assume that Intel and AMD are the majority of the computing market. And that's true if you look at the computer users at home, but if you look at computing as a whole, the world belongs to ARM. The world belongs to the RISC architecture. So their launch with the M1 was interesting, and especially as, as a Linux user, the idea that everyone's shocked that ARM processors can be powerful is, is rather humorous because I've known, I mean, again, the Raspberry Pi, it was designed to be a lightweight machine. 
but we're running the GNOME desktop. I I I was editing a 2K video on this thing, and it was doing a pretty good job. Not not as good as an i7 desktop or laptop chip, but on the idea that this thing was designed to just sip that electricity and you know be incredibly affordable, that says something. But there was some missteps with their launch. Docker compatibility seemed to be a big hiccup. Now I haven't really dived into why that is, but um, I can imagine they were thinking that protocols like Docker are not going to be what the early users of this Mac are going to be. Because anyone who's jumping on this right away is probably going to be just more of a Mac fanatic than your average consumer at this point. Um, the visual refresh was not really there. The It was all internal changes, drastic internal changes, but there's nothing really to make it stand out just yet. And I, I say this all the time, early adopters often are the first one to get screwed. Um, when something first comes to market, you're often going to pay far more um, for a inferior product than if you just wait one or two generations in. That's just how it is. Um, when Ryzen came out, I knew a lot of people who jumped on getting the first version of Ryzen only to have, you know, I think a year later, a cheaper chipset that outperformed their first gen. So even if you are able to get into the Apple ecosystem and you want to go this way, I would at least wait to version two, at least. Having said that, if you are a Linux user, which chances are if you're watching my videos, you are a Linux user, or at least Linux involved, you already know that the ARM processor is actually quite powerful and quite impressive. One thing that came to light around the same time as this launch was with their operating system, Big Sur. And this is where things kind of took a darker turn. And that is... Um, Apparently, every application you launch um, gets hashed and loaded and sent to Apple servers. And apparently, a lot of people did not know this until their servers were slow. Like, if the server doesn't show up, like you're offline, it looks, says, oh, no one's there, and fails gracefully, and the application loads as expected. But when the server was there, but slow people's applications started to drag. People started sniffing their packets and looking at their network, and turns out they were phoning home. And Apple knew they were going to get some grief for phoning home because they actually hid the protocol from a very popular Apple application known as Little Snitch that would uh, dig into your packets and sniff them. So the people had to find this out. They had to find this out on their local area network, which comes back to the idea that you really... If you're going to use Apple, you got to make sure you know that you are not in control. You're not in the driver's seat. Um, it would be a lot cooler if the hardware was open enough that you could be in that driver's seat. But by design, you are locked out. Your place is on the keyboard and nowhere else. You don't open it. You don't repair it. You don't fix it. You simply use. It's a, it's a consumer good at that, which is kind of weird that it these devices are pretty popular with developers and it, and you know you have all these developers who can't upgrade any of their hardware i don't know never really made sense to me things that are amazing about apple's move and are assigned to come of course are this is brings the arm architecture into the mainstream for home computing that i'm excited about because i think that's gonna we are gonna see more arm based options for you know, performance-heavy consumer-grade stuff. I think that's coming. I would love if my next ThinkPad had a RISC-powered chip in it and no fans. Sorry, this is a little different of a video. I kind of went on a little tangent. There's things I really wanted to talk about this because even though, again, not an Apple person, I do find these kind of industry changes impressive. And I look forward to seeing where it's going to go in the future. All right, guys, catch you in the next one.